So, Seamus, I don't know if you recall, uh, some months ago I wrote a really long book review. Uh, I do recall. Uh, so it turns out that uh, that, in concert with some of my 3D modeling I've done, has gotten me a position on the short film version of that same book. What's it called? Shadow of the Conqueror? Is that a sequel to Shadow of the Tomb Raider? Yes. Let's say yes. Or Shadow of the or Shadow of the Colossus or Shadow of Mordor? Shadow of the Colossus Mordor Raider. Perfect. It's actually unrelated. It's uh like a sky island kind of setting. Um and the team is trying to make a short film they're they're working on a Kickstarter film to raise money to make a short film to raise money to make a feature-length film. Because that's how these things go. Well, good luck with that. So, what what are you going to be doing on this project? I am 3D modeling and doing a little bit of animation, but mostly just 3D modeling. That's pretty cool. This smells like a Blender project. I haven't even clicked on the link, but I'm willing to bet all my internet points this is a Blender project. Well, the parts that I'm doing, yes, are in Blender. Uh, the, I mean, there's other guys. It's going to be live action, so there's going to be lots of film, oh. lots of editing, and all that stuff. Oh, I, I honestly thought um, this was a full. This was going to be a full Blender movie, like you see sometimes. But no, this is going to be yeah. a mix of. So, so is this even a heavy Blender project, or you know, is this heavy special effects, or you know, mostly live action. The short is going to be mostly live action. Uh, if and when the feature length film gets produced, there will be a lot of effects, but I think it's still going to be mostly live action. Interesting. Well, good luck. So where's the project now? Uh, there's a Facebook page. Um, that's the, the main place to, to get info on it. And uh, hopefully soon, there will be a Kickstarter. Cool. Not really video game related, but you know. Yeah. For those of you who are curious about it, I will have a link to this Facebook page in the show notes so you can check it out. There's not a lot of info there, but maybe some will be added. So last week, I put up a video on City Skylines. And in that video, I sort of brushed on the topic of what makes a game a game, right? You, you remember that discussion, Paul? Yeah, yeah. That was kind of the, the central question. And then earlier today, I was watching an old John Blow. It's, it's old, but I haven't seen it before. It's left over from 2011. John Blow talk, for those of you who don't um, remember, John Blow is the creative lead behind Braid and The Witness. And the guy currently making the game game programming language, Jai. So he was giving a talk, and I was watching this nine-year-old talk just because I'd never seen it before. And in the middle of it, he had this little pseudocode of what He's like, if you're making a game, then somewhere in your game you have a loop like this. And it's just a loop. And then it called three functions. Input, simulate, and render. And the idea was that no matter what kind of game you're running or making, you can dump everything into one of those three buckets. Right. Like, right. Like, render would also include, you know any output to the user that would be you know force feedback the the sound that comes out of the speakers blinky lights on the controller whatever it is that your game does to communicate with the user render would be that output so really input process output right <laughs> and I, yeah. I started i i paused the video there because it got me thinking to the discussion last week last week i was like you know what if you want to call dear esther a game that's fine with me. You know, my definition of game is super broad and, you know, includes a lot of things that 
don't have a lose state, that don't have a win state, that don't have that are you know that don't have what we would traditionally consider gameplay. Like Dear Esther is walk forward and here in in its simplest forms is walk down this linear path, listening to voice clips until you reach the end, and that's it. Like there's no right. there's there's no challenge. As long as you can walk forward, you can beat this game. But I started thinking about that in context of the, the you know, what is a game discussion. And I realized that my definition of game as a programmer was different than my definition of a game as a player. Oh, sure. Right, like, I... You know, if somebody shows me Dear Esther, do you consider this a game? I'm like, sure. It feels, you know, it's it's interactive. Sure, it's playing me sound clips and I walk forward to get to the end. It's not a challenging game, but, you know, that's a game. But if I was making Dear Esther, I would not feel like I was making a game because that would just be... That would leave out the simulate, right? There's nothing to simulate there. <laughs> You right. Just input, simulate, and render. And there's nothing to do in simulate. It's just input and draw your input. It's like, you know, you move the mouse and the mouse pointer moves around. That's not a game. You could make a game out of it, you know, like, um, you know, making you your... Boyd's make, following the cursor or your cursor is a, right. a, a character or something. Right, you can, oh, I'm going to get steer my mouse cursor between all these words as I scroll down the page. And you can invent a game out of that in your own mind. But just simply, user creates input, and then you display that input is not a game for, to me as a programmer. Because I'm not involved. <laughs> I'm not doing anything on my side of, the, of this game, right, as the, as the developer. I'm not making a system. And so, if I was playing Dear Esther, I would say, yeah, this is a game. And if I was making Dear Esther, I would be like, I'm not making a game. I'm making some sort of interactive experience. Some sort of passive experience. And a I thought that was really A very complicated media player. Yeah! <laughs> An overly complicated media player. Oh, so I thought that was interesting. That, and just uh, sort of builds on the idea that I introduced in my video, that the definition that, of what is a game that we have in our heads is radically different. So I say the word game, you hear, you, you hear the word and you picture one concept, another person pictures another concept. I'm thinking about a a completely different concept than either of you. And then I realized that it's even more complicated than that because it's two di for me, it's two different concepts depending on which side of the screen I'm on. And that right. was really weird. There are two different definitions, at least inside of each person. Right, right. No, if you're not a game developer, then maybe your two definitions are the same, no matter what you're doing. So is arguing about the definition of game a game. Uh, well, there's no win state, that's for sure. Nobody's ever reached it. <laughs> I feel like I win all the time. <laughs> I just, I win, I win right away. Everybody else is wrong, so I guess that makes me the <laughs> winner. Right. Oh, man. It is fun to, to listen to Jonathan Bloat think about stuff out loud. Uh, I don't know if you've watched any of his live streams. Uh, very occasionally, I kind of let the YouTube algorithm bring the cream to the top, and then the really popular ones I'll watch. I just started, I just started one today. This is an interesting thing. It was somebody else posted this live stream of his, and it's like John Blow gives his most important talk on programming. And then it's just him sitting in his kitchen and somebody asks him a question and he starts to answer and he stops and he pauses for like a long time. Like it feels like a full minute and then he starts to answer 
and he starts to drift off to a t tangent, and then he stops, and he thinks. And I'm like a couple minutes into this thing, and there was some screwing around at the beginning that wasn't related to this. So I've watched several minutes of this, and he has not begun discussing programming. So either this person is trolling super hard, or I'm <laughs> going to hit this mother load of profound insights any minute now. He's, he's going to open his mouth and utter the word that ends the world. Right? Of course, that's what it all means. I don't need to I don't need to live the rest of my life now. I've got the answer here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and spoiler, I closed that. I'm looking through my tabs right now wondering what happened to that talk. And it's gone. I might still have it somewhere in my history, I suppose, if I can find it. I've been watching YouTube all day, so good luck sorting for it. Oh, no. Well, yeah, I, I do um, occasionally watch his streams, and they're usually not super dense with profundity. But uh, occasionally he... It's usually when he gets annoyed at someone for asking a question or or uh, re making him repeat himself or something. And, you know, when you have to think about something over and over again, you tend to refine it down so that you can you can make your responses as, as short as possible. And uh, it's those times when I feel like he has the, the best quips. Oh, my, my experience of that is the opposite. The more I chew on something, the more it just keeps expanding away from me. Like, that's what happened with my Mass Effect series. Is like I just wanted to start off with this thesis about how the new writer didn't understand the old and it led to all these problems. And every time I was like, okay, if I say that, someone is going to disagree with me. So I'll need to address that. Oh, but while I'm addressing that, I'm going to bring up this other thing and somebody's going to disagree with that. So, like, I've got this one little thesis perched at the top and then it's just this giant pyramid under it of supporting arguments. <laughs> And, you know, heading people off before they before they try and dismiss the whole thing. So my, my <laughs> arguments get bigger the longer I think about them. That's probably bad, but I don't know. Well, it's the difference between, what is it, deductive and inductive reasoning, I think? Oh, don't, don't ask going me. From... I can never keep those two straight. <laughs> <laughs> general, you, you go from the general principle and then... And then work out the details from there, and so and there's no end of details, right? And then the other way around is you you go from all these details and you work backward toward a general principle, and there's no end of details that you can uh, you can encompass in a single a single thesis, and so like you can go either way, right? And either way, you can just keep building forever and never get to where you're right. going. Well, I, mean, I guess it depends on where you're going. Speaking of which, where are we going? What, what's going on in this diecast? What's happened? I don't know. We got off track, but that's fine. I Let's think talk about video learned... games. Have you talked? Have you have you played any video games this last week? I have not. I can't even account for my time this week. Like I don't know what I did. I well, I published that video, but like that was Tuesday. And where'd the rest of the week go? I honestly can't tell you. It seems like it was just Wednesday, and now it's Saturday night. I don't know what's going on. What happened to those four days or whatever? Your YouTube history will probably tell you. <laughs> I don't know that I was watching. Okay, yesterday I, I picked the guitar back up for, for the hey. first time in, like, probably five weeks. I picked my guitar up and I was like, you know what? I could just go for a nice relaxing, you know, do, do. And I picked it up and I realized I couldn't remember anything. Look, I, you know, <laughs> weeks ago I'd had it where I knew like five or six chords and was getting so that I could move from between them with relative ease. And I realized I couldn't remember anything. Any of okay, I can remember E minor, which is like baby's first chord. That's like the easiest chord to hit on the entire guitar. You just basically grasp it and and strike the strings in some way, and you will probably be making an E minor chord. <laughs> 
Um, that's all I remembered. And I like sat there dumbfounded and realized I spent all those days practicing and it's all gone. Is this normal or am I, am I really losing? You know, as you get old, you start wondering, oh no, is this it? Is it all going to start losing slipping my touch? Away now? Yeah. So I, I spent the afternoon, you know, watching tutorials. Watching tutorials I know I've watched before. And then, you know, it explain, oh, and here's an A minor chord. And I put my hand on it and be like, that feels familiar. Right. Okay. But I couldn't like recall any of it until I had it re explained to me. So that was yeah. that was that was frustrating. I felt like I'd make a little made a little bit of progress. And I kind of got booted all the way back to the beginning. Well, like you said, it feels familiar, and it's because the, um, how does it go? Your, so your, um, your body has, in general, two different kinds of, of memory. It's got muscle memory and, and uh, cognitive memory, and your cognitive memory gets overwritten all the time, and so you can't remember, like when you think about it, you can't remember it. But your muscles remember for a lot longer than your, your cognitive center, and so when you're playing a song or if you've you know you've got a chord memorized or something and and you go to make that action if you can bypass your cognitive memory and just go straight to your muscle memory and let your body do it then uh it'll still be there almost all the time it's like riding a bike kind of thing it's it's in right. your body you can, it's not in your brain you can remember how to ride a bike even if you don't remember the bike lessons yeah exactly which i it's barely not, it's like that with I with remember um, that. <laughs> it's like that with piano for me, where I'll, I can play a song, but if I try to remember how the song goes, I can't play it anymore, because my brain is thinking about it, and, and it's, not letting, it's not letting my arms play the song, right? And it's just like, no, you gotta stop, you gotta let it go, and just, and just play it. Yeah. I wish I'd, I wish I'd done a little more practice in there so I didn't have to go back to the start. You know, I probably could have spent yesterday building on what I knew before if I just done a little more, just little refreshers here and there, just a couple minutes, you know, every few days would have let me retain that knowledge so that yesterday I wouldn't have had to start over. Yeah. I, I don't know what kind of exercise you do on the guitar, but for the piano, it's just like chords and arpeggios. You just play every chord and every arpeggio in every key every day <laughs> and like and, and eventually you know after like a year or two then you can then your body knows all that stuff but it's yeah it's brutal it's just like a lot and a lot a lot of practice and i was thinking hey it would be cool if there was a way to gamify this just so that you can see feedback so that you can see yourself improve and i actually have rocksmith which is Guitar Hero for people who actually want to play a real guitar. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's not fun, though. <laughs> it's it's a terrible learning tool. It Like, I tried it when I first picked up the guitar, and I was like, this is just terrible. I don't... Like, you... One of the problems with Rocksmith is it would just, like, wrong. And I'm like, what? What? I felt like I was doing... That. Oh, I, I missed another one now. Well, the wrong... Okay, well, what what am I doing wrong? And I'm like, this is not learning. It's just the computer saying wrong to me over and over and over <laughs> again. Uh, and you know, a teacher would say, "Oh, your your finger slipped off. You're on the wrong string there," or "Hey, you're you strumming a string you shouldn't be." You know, a teacher would tell you what you're doing wrong. And so, Rocksmith can't do that. And it doesn't, and it's trying to be Guitar Hero, just scrolling crap at you. When to right. me, it seems like it should display what it thinks you're playing, you know. And then I would get some sort of feedback, like, oh, I see the wrong note. I can hear the wrong note, but I can also see it. You know, it'll display an E instead of a D. Or I, I know it's not easy to to peel chords apart like that. That takes sophisticated software. But it must already be doing that since it can tell I'm not playing the right notes. And Yeah, uh, it must be doing some kind of analysis. Right, it has to be. And, you know, 
showing me what I should be doing, like showing me the fret that I should be, where my finger should be on the fret. Like that would be an interesting teacher. But no, it's just like, well, let's copy Guitar Hero, but you use a real guitar. And I'm like, this is a terrible teaching tool. The, <laughs> like that works great be on Guitar Hero because it's scrolling colored buttons at you. And those buttons match the buttons on your guitar. <laughs> On your right. fake plastic Guitar Hero guitar. The, they're not scrolling fretboards at you in, in Rocksmith. So I remember playing uh, the, the, probably the best learning game that I ever played was Mario Teaches Typing. Oh, interesting. Like, it was really educational? Well, yeah, it was it was like a it was a touch t typing software where you're supposed to learn how to type, and so it, I, I don't know how did you learn to touch or do you touch type? Okay, here's the story. I took a t touch typing course in tenth grade. Got pretty good, pretty fast at touch typing. No, no, not pretty fast. Moderate. I was a moderate typer, but then. I'd come home, and this was like, a, they thought the kids taking this class wanted to be secretaries. Like, that's what it was oriented around. Here's how you write a cover letter, and here's how you touch type, and here's how, okay. It was like drills for that. It wasn't like programming. Take transcription because, or whatever. Right, because it didn't occur to anybody like, well, what would you do with a computer and a keyboard? <laughs> I can't imagine. So then I'd come home from my from the full-size typewriter keyboard we were practicing on. They, they were electronic typewriters, but they were still laid out like a classic, you know, it's it prints on paper, not not on the screen. Yeah. And I'd come home to my teeny tiny chiclet keyboard that even my 14-year-old hands were too big for it. And I oh, couldn't... no. You, you couldn't touch type on the dang thing. It was just awful. So I, you know, default to typing with four fingers, you know, both index fingers, both thumbs. And I was stuck with that computer for years. And then I got like a real IBM machine and I realized I can't touch type anymore. <laughs> so I used to be able to touch type, but it was ruined by a terrible keyboard. Man. Well, when I was learning to type, uh, keyboards were already cheap and standardized enough that we mercifully didn't have that problem. Nice. Unfortunately, it also meant that my parents and all my friends' parents expected us to be able to type proficiently, and we didn't have the excuse that we had a tiny keyboard. So we had to, we had to learn to type, and uh, there were two... Or maybe three. No, I, I think there were only two. There was there was um, two pieces of software that we we had the option to use. It was Mario teaches typing and Mavis Beacon teaches typing. And uh, right, Mavis. There's a great. Did you ever see the LGR video on Mavis Beacon? No, I didn't. I'll link it in the show Don't notes. To, yeah, put it in the show notes. Uh, I just, I remember that Mavis Beacon was my first experience with something that felt like DRM. It wasn't actually DRM, but uh, what this software would do is that it wanted you to practice, you know, intentionally be typing. And so your, your fingers are moving, you're actively engaging, you're, you know, exercising your typing abilities. And then every 10 minutes or something, or 30 minutes or whatever, uh, it would put up a little pop-up saying, okay, now it's time to take a break. You know, don't push yourself too hard and, you know, stress your fingers or whatever. And that was kind of annoying because, oh. like, hey, I'm making progress. I'm, like, you know, I'm learning under, yeah. under duress, but I'm learning. And right. I don't want to, you know, like, take a break. Right, and that's one thing. If you're 30, hey, you better stand up and stretch and make sure you don't hurt your back. But it's like, you know, if you're 12, it's like, I could do this all friggin' day. My skeleton is made of is made of rubber. I'm good. I'm like um, a wolverine. Right? We I heal instantly. Blister on my <laughs> blister on my foot today, healed tomorrow. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's another thing is uh 
There's, did it start off with an ergonomics, you know, oh, make sure you're sitting up in your chair and, you know, yeah, everything like yeah, that? Yeah, did. Yeah, my, when I did my typing, my keyboard was resting on a nightstand and I was kneeling on the floor. That was my computer. <laughs> that was my computer desk for the first, like, five years of programming. And, a you know, in my... Floor. But no, it was carpeted. It was carpeted. Oh, it was my bedroom floor, and okay. um, and my screen was of course not an LCD. It was a CRT. It was a television, a regular like seventies tele color television that was just inches from my face, just strobing <laughs> me in the face in the dark as I knelt on the floor and typed on the undersized keyboard. It's a miracle I can walk today. <laughs> And C. Right. Electron beam scanning right toward your eyeballs. Right. Uh, get the photons, get, get them down in there good so I see the see the information real good. Fire directly <laughs> into, into my eye. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, okay. So, we're, man, we're so far off track. This is wonderful. All right, so... Um, so it would do this pop-up, right? And it was like, okay, that's annoying when you're when you're learning to type. Um, so then, like, once we had done a half hour of of Mavis Beacon teaches typing, then we could play a half hour of video games. It's like, oh yeah, finally, what we've been working yes. for. And so you start up Warcraft three or uh, I don't know. Uh, we didn't have like. What games did we have? Civilization or Dark Rain or something, and uh, you know, start start getting stuck in, and you're you know moving units around, and then uh, about you know maybe about ten minutes in there, Mavis Beacon's pop up pops up and says, "Hey, looks like you've been working for about ten minutes. You should take a break." <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. And if you were playing in full screen mode, it would take time to switch out of full screen mode so that it could pop up the little message box because the software the little program that popped up that message box was a separate piece of software from the mavis beacon teaches typing software so when you close down mavis beacon that thing was still running in the background oh so evil and uh, so then we learned how to run the task manager <laughs> you became hackers that day that's right. And uh, and then we didn't have to put up with the little pop-up even when we were doing the typing. So anyway, we hated me of his beacon because it was, it was annoying like that in every way. Um, but Mario Teaches Typing was actually pretty good because it, it was uh, lightweight. It just had like... the So the idea was that you're Mario and you're, you know, jumping to break blocks, except the blocks have a, a letter or number on them, and you have to type that letter to break the block. And the faster you can do it, the faster Mario runs to break the blocks. And so, you know, there's instant feedback. If you push the wrong button, then it doesn't break. And it, you know, it shows what key you did press in the block. And so you're looking nice. at exactly the spot where you're trying to get the feedback. Um, and it does it by row. So, you know, you're doing home row and there's a whole level with home row and then the top row and then home and top row and, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I, I think they had one where it was like, when you were swimming, and so then when you were on the the ones that were on the bottom row were underwater blocks, and then there was like the ones on the surface, and then the ones up in the air were like the flying uh, turtles or something, and so you could tell which row they were supposed to be on from the position on the screen. And so it was it was clever and it was lightweight and it worked nice. well, and uh, and we loved it. It was great. So, so and let's see, we're getting back to uh, teaching wait, wait, wait. learning I have software. I have a question about this. What platform was this on? It's on the PC. So Mario has been on the PC. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how they how do they pull that one off, but yeah, it was it was a a Nintendo software thing, I guess, or a third party guy got licensed to it. I gotta look this up now. Oh man, you can play it online now. Huh. Can play it online. That's cool. I might actually want to try that for a few minutes. We were talking about 
muscle memory earlier. I'm curious how much of my touch typing muscle memory remains. Like, I know when I just sit there and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to type what's in my head, touch type, I can't. I have no idea which of my fingers I'm... Even though I know, like, when I'm typing with my, my you know, my four-fingered typing style that's horrible and slow, I can type there, but I can't touch type like that. I wonder if I was playing that kind of typing game, if I would be able to do it. Because I'm transcribing something else and not creating it myself. That's interesting. Yeah. It'd be, it would be a good experiment. Um, looks like 1992 release for MS-DOS. Windows and Macintosh in 1995. Amazing. That was a very different Nintendo than the one we have today. Put their game on a PC. They wouldn't do that now. Yeah, well, it wasn't exactly a game. Right. Or was it? <laughs> That's an interesting question. It did, st I'll bet it had win states and lose states, but it was, it was a game, but educational in nature, I suppose. So, there's another kind of game that does have simulation, but doesn't have very interactive graphics. Oh? Because, like, when you're thinking about the game, right, like, like you were saying, there's the input, there's the simulation, and there's the render. And a lot of times we think of the render as being kind of like, if it's really dynamic, then that's, like, really a game. And if the rendering is all very samey, like a spreadsheet or something, then it's not really a game. Right. But um, the I remember the Myst series came out right around that time, too. When, when was Myst released? Uh, that would coincided with the rise of CD-ROMs, so sometime in the mid-90s. Yeah. And, uh, and Myst was kind of this crazy thing where it was all pre-rendered, but it was, the interface was good enough that you could, you could kind of imagine that you were walking around. It was kind of, it was kind of a first-person exploration puzzle game. Yeah. Okay, 1993 for Mac OS and 94 for Windows. There you go. And 95 for Mario Teaches Typing. So, recently, uh, I got an email from GOG saying, Hey, if you click this button, we'll give you a discount on all the missed games that there ever were. And I couldn't help myself, so I, I bought all of them. That's cool. I was I saw that same deal. I clicked on it and I realized I already owned all of them. <laughs> Except I never played the online one. Uru. Right, I never played Uru. But I think that's sort of funny that like what was I expecting? That there was some new mist game that I had somehow or not new, some ancient mist game that I had somehow never heard about. Oh, right, Miss Two and a Half. Right, I never got around to playing that one. Missed the Fogging, the prequel. <laughs> Missed Zero. This <laughs> all spiky hair and robots. <laughs> so I booted up Mist and uh, I was playing it with my kids, and they were. They were interested in it. It was kind of interesting. They they were not at all put off by the graphics or, I mean, they played Minecraft, so it's like, oh, yeah, this is fine. This is all legit. Checks out. Sure. Uh, I was navigating, so maybe if they were trying to, you know, click on the edges of the screen to turn and stuff, they'd have problems. But um, I didn't really remember anything about it. But I, I knew... It was possible to solve the puzzles, and so I feel like that helped a lot. You know how when you get into a game and you're kind of, you kind of wonder like, is this is this for real? Like, is the developer playing fair with me, or are they just jerking me around? Right. And uh, I knew that the that the missed games were playing fair with me, and so I I don't know. I got almost all the way to the end in a couple hours. It was kind of it was kind of fun. Um. So that was the first missed game, and I was like, oh, well, you know, I played Riven a little bit. I never owned Riven. 
I own Mist 3 uh, Exile, I think, and I played through that whole thing. And so I remember Mist 3, but then I, I kind of lost touch with the series after that. Uh, Mist 4 and Mist 5 and Uru. I played a bit of Uru, but uh, I'd never really touched Mist 4 and 5, and so I was like, hey, maybe I should maybe I should check these out, see if they're, you know, see if they're any good. And so I booted up Mist 5 End of Ages, and... Uh, it's all in 3D, and it's all textured, which strangely makes the graphics slightly worse than the original Mist. Right. Right. And you know what? I said I'd played them all. I have not played Mist 5. And for those who are curious, Riss, uh, Riven is my favorite of the series. Oh, Riven's anyway. so good. Yeah. Oh. So, uh... So yeah, so I I started playing Mist Five and walking around and y you don't by default you don't have first person controls. It's still like click on the edge of the screen to turn and stuff, and it feels like uh, I don't know. Like I, I felt like it was helpful because otherwise I would just be running around and bonking into walls and like looking in every corner, looking for secrets and stuff. And right. by by putting the camera at specific spots and looking at specific things that it's a way for the game designer to communicate to the player this thing's important and you don't have to worry about the wall here or whatever you don't have to like walk sideways down all the hallways looking at the walls right and i feel like that's kind of missing from a lot of games where you're in first person you can look anywhere you can do anything and it's like well okay but what am i supposed to do and so then the game developer has to go through all the trouble of either doing really good level design with lighting and and sight lines and pathing and color design and and you know communicating to the player through the environment or they just have to have like little icons over everything being like go here or have a a, a quest helper right. shouting in your ear move to the checkpoint soldier or whatever and i think the universal reaction to those is yuck like ugh. <laughs> Mega Man, Mega Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's still the best video. That is a brilliant it's video on game so design. Good. I forget. Oh. It's still, I, for, I forget who made that. I should link that more often, but I can never remember who made it. And so, so I appreciated Mist Five was, you know, uh, giving me the option to let it tell me what to look at. Uh, but then I got like I was just you know walking down the halls like okay where do I go I go down this way I guess and kind of wandering around and uh, I walked into this place and like you know I was mousing over stuff and like something happened and then like my character walks back out of this weird bubble and then I got locked into an, a cutscene it wasn't like an animated cutscene it was an in-engine cutscene and this lady like starts talking to me about like Oh, you the, the tablets responded to you, and now you have to make a, a choice, and you have to. And my father's is gone, and it's not his time anymore, and on and on, and like okay, like so this is like you know the mocap or something, except it wasn't mocap because it was all FK animated, and so it was all like janky, and they had I think it was like animated face capture, and then they projected it onto the model, so it. Ooh. It looked kind of. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't good either, and and so I'm sitting here. I'm like, okay, I'm enduring this this thing, and she finishes her long speech. She's finally like giving me the history of her her whole family and like their whole world and everything has happened. And but it's all vague and like you know how the miss games get a little bit. I don't know. Yeah. Mystery. -y. Yeah. But instead of, like, being in a book that you can leaf through and then just put back on the shelf and never read again, this is like, nope, I've grabbed the camera, and you're just going to watch me and listen to me and enjoy this poorly animated, poorly video projected thing. And so Be like, obtuse oh, okay, and fine. pretend you're being pro profound. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's kind of the thing. And I didn't mind that in the early Myst games. And part of it was you could see actors on the screen emoting... And sure, it looks terrible by today's standards, but they were real genuine performances and you could enjoy it the way you'd enjoy a stage play. But yeah. once you've got like 
3D models, like you lose all of that. That's that sounds yuck. Not having seen it myself, yeah. that sounds not good. So anyway, so I endured through that thing and she's like, now you must begin. And she teleports me and, you know, there's the, the mist teleporting sound or whatever. I guess you're not even touching books by the end that, you know, mist five, they've done away with all that. It's just all bubbles and hand waving. So then you land in like the first age or whatever. I'm like, oh, cool. Now I'm going to start exploring. Nope. No, that's not what's going to happen. I'm going to watch another poorly animated cutscene now there's another character and he's like oh she's lied to you and there's there's a mystery and you can't give her the tablet and and so I, i'm sitting here watching this guy and this joker is going on and on and so now i'm like you know what control shift escape end task this is i'm done with this oh that, so that was bad. five end of ages it was it was the end of of the mist for me what a shame I mean that's just yeah. I mean that's just the first game again. Oh, two people, each of them is has is telling you the other one is lying. <laughs> right? <laughs> but don't don't bring him the red pages, bring me the blue pages. Right? Oh, I'm watching it on YouTube now. Yeah, I can see this is just so much less compelling even though these are probably great graphics for when the game came out. They look dated in a way that the original mist sure the original mist looks pixelated but it still has genuine human performances this talking um 3d model is weird and stiff it's yeah it's odd and i mean this would be fine if she just like Oh, hey, you want to go this way, and I'm your friend, and now, you know, look for look for the notes I left scattered around the world. And, you know, she only talked for 15 or 20 seconds. But to have a, I don't even know how long this, I'm, I'm scanning through this cutscene. It just Four goes minutes, on, doesn't five, it? six, seven, oh, eight, oh. So that's a four-minute cutscene from the four-minute mark to the eight-minute mark. Might be a little over. And how long is I didn't even stay through the guy's speech. How long is his speech? Oh yeah, and it goes directly from her into him. Well, he starts at the eight minute mark conveniently and runs all the way to the end of the video. Is he even done here at ten and his is two and a half minutes. So all oh, told I was almost done. Six and a oh, half wow. minutes of solid just talking to the player. And I feel like that's that's a severe regression. The first game did things with hints because they had to. They couldn't just make you watch a performance for several minutes, and certainly not at the beginning of the game. Well, I mean, they could have, but they didn't. Like, they chose right, to they, let you explore. Yeah. There was a sense of mystery. Right. Uh, they realized, we. oh, we can't do that. That would be terrible. <laughs> right. And then this fifth game recycles the idea from the first game, it sounds like, where you've got two people, both of them are probably villains, and each of them is trying to convince you they're the good guy and the other person's the villain. And, uh, but now it has this terrible presentation. Like, the first game, yeah, each of the guys presented themselves as the good one and the other as the villain, but you learned the truth by exploring the worlds. And you could see how each of them behaved. Oh, look, this guy's gathering riches and fine things. Oh, look, this guy is the kind of guy that would, like, hurt animals to amuse himself. And all his stuff is really mean and looks vaguely tortury. And that just clued you in. Creepy guy. Man. Right. Cirrus is just a creepy guy. <laughs> He's the creepiest. And so the it wasn't like they had... Yeah, they didn't spell it out for you. You had to look at the environment. Now, maybe this game works that way and it just has a terrible introduction. I don't know. But yeah, yeah it sounds like a either. terrible regression. So then I was curious. I was like, hey, maybe if I go back to Mist 4, like, maybe I can see where this path, like, did they go wrong at Mist 4? Or had it started to gone, gone wrong at Mist 3 and I never really picked it up? Like, I don't know. And so I booted up Mist 4, uh, and it locked up my computer. Oh, 
I barely remember Mist 4. Oh my gosh, you run into that guy, you know, that, that six minute cutscene. You run into him yeah. three minutes later, and he talks for. Is that four minutes? Three or four minutes. <laughs> that's just. I mean, <laughs> that's not bad in like a Mass Effect game where you're driving the conversation and asking questions. But this is linear. You're not asking him questions. You're just listening to someone talk. That's terrible. We're back to the very complicated media player. First, the stone slate. Oh, it's, he's just like, it's just a fetch quest. Like, this is the kind of thing you wouldn't even need to t teach the player. Or explain to the player. This should be the kind of stuff they should figure yeah, out on their yeah. own. And the, like, and the lady already just kept harping on about the stone plate to begin with. Oh, now I'm curious if uh, if this was handed off to a new team because it feels like it makes mistakes that the original creators knew better than to do. These sorts uh, of yeah, things. Oh yeah, maybe maybe Ubisoft had had a hand in it or something. Although Cyan is still the developer, right? Right, but maybe they farmed it out to a different team while they did other stuff. I don't know. Maybe they were running yeah. Uru or something while this was being made. Yeah, that's true. I don't know the timeline. It's been a decade since I looked at this series. Yeah. So, play Mist and Riven. They're man. If you guys leave comments in the in the comments below, if you guys have fond memories of Mist and Riven, because boy, genre defining I games. I loved Riven. Riven, like Mist, was good, but after playing Riven, I didn't want to go back to Mist. But Riven, I still enjoy like seeing bits of Riven and you know watching LPs on, on, on YouTube once in a while. Just so gorgeous. So what do you say we do some mailbags? All right. Dear DieCast, in episode 300, Seamus talked about how he would like to work on a game without having to worry about money, possibly even open up, open it, probably open it up for contribution by anyone. Um, to clarify, when I said open source, I sort of meant, like, not let other people contribute, but see, let, let other people see it and do their own spinoffs or, you know, make suggestions, but I wasn't just going to let, you know... The yay who's in the We're internet. We're going to crowdsource hip. the project. Right. I didn't want people hip-firing uh, changes to my code. Or de burying me in like, oh, I fixed your thing here. But I, I like, you know, discussing <laughs> what they've seen. You know, oh, maybe this could be done better. Anyway, on with the email. Have you considered looking at existing free software projects? Something like Xenonautic, Battle of West, for West's North, Endless Sky, Worm Sun, or Vega Strike. Maybe just the thing where you can add small features you want without having to start the entire project from scratch. Veil, vale, Tim. See, here's the thing. Yes, I don't want the responsibility of, like, you know, stepping up, making a promise to thousands of people to deliver a product by a certain date, and then worrying I might fail and let all those people down having taken their money and spent it without giving them what they were promised. That that would just stress me out endlessly. On the other hand, I'm also incredibly selfish, and I don't want to work on other people's projects. <laughs> like, <laughs> I want to work on right. projects that interest me, um, which would be stuff, you know, sort of emergent gameplay, procedurally generated environments, you know, sort of those sorts of games just because that's how I know what to do so I wouldn't be interested in in contributing to somebody else's project like I want to make my own stuff in the and in a practical sense that would be bad because it would be much harder for me to write about it and I, I need to do things that can feed the blog I can open up some code and go wow look at this bullshit I wrote for years ago this is terrible this is a terrible here's why this was a terrible mistake and a bad design for me to make and that's fine 
But if I join an open source project and then all of a sudden post a 5,000 word article on why the previous person who wrote this module didn't know what they were doing, that makes me an asshole. <laughs> that makes me a toxic <laughs> jackass. And nobody would want to work on a project with me. Oh, look at, the, look at these mistakes that Bob made. Oh, this is terrible. Even his comments are wrong. <laughs> Right. Even even though it's no more it's no more mean spirited than saying the same thing about yourself. It's still right. It still feels bad. Unless I'm good friends with Bob, yeah, there's no way I can do there's no way. So I'd have to be like really I wouldn't be able to just do really critical analysis of code. So I think open source project yeah. I wouldn't be leading the project. That's what I want. I want all the power, but none of the responsibility. Don't we all? Right? That's just, why can't I do whatever I want, but if I fail, I don't have to take responsibility. Actually, I don't mind taking responsibility. I do mind taking other people's money. <laughs> that's the part that scares me. I don't want to let Why can't I down. take all the money and just never answer for it? Why is that a problem? Yeah. Right? This doesn't need to be so hard. One of the reasons I'm grateful for Patreon, it's sort of this understood thing. Well, I'm going to do whatever interests me on my blog. And if you don't like it, you can stop giving at any time. It's not like I promise to deliver X number of articles on topic, on topic Y by date Z. Then... then I would just be paralyzed with fear and frustration and anxiety. <laughs> Especially if it's public, right? Like you could, you could take a, right. a like a, a gig or something. But if it's like this is a public promise and everyone knows that I'm gonna I'm gonna be squared up against this thing I said I would do, which one will win in the cage right. match tonight? Yeah, if I, if I took a job for doing that, then I'd be okay. Because it's just one person, they know, they know the deal. I haven't made a promise to thousands of strangers. And this other person presumably has some way of measuring my progress, and they know that I'm actually working on it, and not just playing Minecraft all day and taking their money. Like, there, there's the accountability. <laughs> City skylines or whatever. whatever. Whatever my vice is this month. So you would want to be like the lead designer on a project that someone else was handling all the funding and stuff. Yes. And then they wouldn't impose, even though they're handling all the money and taking all the responsibility, I don't want them to impose any decisions on me, you know, to make sure the, the project is financially stable. You know, it would, a lot more people would buy it if you... If you took out the loud screaming sound effect every time the player died and didn't have it erase their files off their computer. I'm like, no, that's my creative vision, damn it. <laughs> Part of my creative vision to procedurally generate screen sounds for death. Aren't they amazing? <laughs> I'm an artist, damn you. Can't defeat art. All right. Oh man, well this segues really nicely into the next question. Go for it. Dear DieCast, my wife and I have recently been discussing the possibility of becoming parents. Um, um, oh, uh, hmm. oh, they're not asking us about how to do that. Okay. I, I read ahead. They're okay. not asking how Good. to. Oh. Yes. Because we don't know either. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It keeps happening, but somehow it, it, it is a mystery. Um, yes. Uh, so, both James and Paul have been down this particular path several times before, and as, I, as far as I can tell, uh, you both seem to have been highly successful in raising your children. Well, yeah, don't speak too soon, I guess. Um, let's see. This is a very long question. Uh, technologically literate. Do you have any opinions on how to raise children in the modern era of ubiquitous technology? All right. I think I think that's good. The 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 magic word that made me raise an eyebrow at this is the dreaded word of screen time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for the question, Nick. I'm sorry, I stepped on the end of it there. 
Yeah, so I see the word screen time and my eye begins twitching because I know exactly where this argument's going. So where do I come down on... It, it, this is a big topic. All right. All right, I, I will go first because I sense that you and I have very different answers. I know, Paul, everybody complains that you and I are like two different flavors of the same dude, but here is an area where I think we will really have major differences. Okay. okay, fire away. So, Heather and I were both raised in very strict households. And so that's, you know, the kind of parenting style you adopt. At the same time, I like noticed this thing that, um, boy, it's okay. I'm going to have to tiptoe around a religion here a little bit. Uh, there's this thing. Yeah, I don't this know. This is like politics and religion all over, right? I Raising know. Raising children. Can... How do you do it? Ah, uh. Okay. Here's an observation I made growing up. I've already written about this on my blog and it didn't blow up then. Maybe it won't blow up now, but I noticed Growing up, I knew a lot of preacher's kids. Now, Paul, you're Catholic, so maybe you don't have this experience because traditionally um, people that lead Catholic churches don't tend to have very big families. <laughs> they tend to just be priests and have no kids at all. Well, my grandfather was actually a preacher's kid, so... Oh, okay, well... Oh, no. Oh, shit, now... now now I'm going to be insulting your, your parents. No! <laughs> All right. Here's the thing about preacher's kids. The ones that I knew in the churches that I went to, it was very, very common for the worst kids to be the kids of the preacher. Like, growing up, even not even kids that um, I went to church with. Just kids that I knew that were little bastards. And what I noticed is they all came from extremely strict households. And what you get when you have extremely... The, again, this is just my observation that we're only talking about four or five families here. So this isn't like a... This is... I'm not speaking for all parenting everywhere. This is just a pattern I noticed growing up. Is that all of these kids growing up had very strict parents that like regulated every... Like TV, movies... Everything was very closely monitored. And they chafed under that. And so they would get really, really good at lying. And they were brilliant mm. liars. Because, you know, they had no room to move. The only way they could do anything, they had to be lying all the time to just function. Now, this is obviously coming from strict churches, and, and but this is something Heather and I noticed, and we both came from fairly strict households, and where you obey something because it's the rule. And so we started off with that parenting style, and our oldest daughter, Bay, was super rebellious, just absolutely, just, you know, you tell her to do something and she doesn't want to do it. And we were really... Like, Just our, because you're telling her to do it. Not because it's something right. she doesn't even want to do. Sometimes like, you know, eat your dinner. She's like, I'm hungry. I don't want to eat my dinner, but I'm not going to because you're telling me to. Right. And I noticed, I remembered uh, another thing my mom used to do with me. Once in a blue moon, she'd be like, oh, fine, leave your room a mess. See if I care. And she'd storm out of the room. And then all of a sudden I wanted to clean my room. <laughs> like, now that I wasn't being forced to, now I was willing to, but I didn't want to, like, I want my room to be clean, but I want to do it because I want to do it, not because I'm being forced to do it. And Heather and I talked about it, and we were like, you know, what if instead of just absolutely going, just bringing the hammer of justice down on her, what if we just relax? And like, okay, here's the thing, you know, she's in her teens by now early teens and we're like all right you know you want to have freedom you 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 don't want to have us deciding what you eat and when you go to bed and what sort of things you do fine but you still have to take responsibility for your actions like you can't like leave a big mess of dishes for everyone else to clean up because that's not fair to the rest of us 
but as long as you're helping around here in some way and not making life hard for the rest of us, you can decide, you know, what are you going to learn? What are you, how are you going to use your time? And this wasn't a, a real hard line that we crossed. This was sort of a, over a few weeks, we just sort of started giving her more and more leash and then sort of like, well, why are we holding the leash? We just hand her the leash there. It's your freedom, <laughs> but also your responsibility. Right. And she suddenly matured like 10 years and she had a ridiculous planning horizon that Heather and I never had at that age. You know, as like an early teen, I was just like, do whatever your parents do, like whatever. And she's thinking about what she wants to do with her life and how she wants to do it. And she's thinking about marriage and, you know, she's planning things, earning money. She was so livid that she couldn't get a job. She'd be like, go from, she just went into town and started talking to people like, hey, I'm not 16. Are you willing to hire me? I really, I'm willing to, I'll work hard. And they're like, no, I can't. It's illegal. I can't hire you. And she was just so angry. Why won't anybody let me work? I want to earn some money and like do things. And was ready to like plan moving out. And there was no more animosity. But it wasn't like she was trying to move out because she hated her parents. In fact, our, our relationship with her instantly got way, way better. She was just hitting that, that point of wanting to move into an adult way of living way before we were expecting it. And so at that point, we started questioning, and we, it, like it fixed our relationship with our daughter. And we looked at the other two kids and like, well, let's not do that again. <laughs> 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 and so Isaac has never known hard rules. He's, he's other than what we gave to bed. Hey, look, don't leave messes for other people. And he's so unlike Heather and I, he'll walk into the room. He'll do some, he'll, do things on his own without being forced to. He just sees doing work and helping the family as a totally natural thing to do. He does it because he sees us do it, not because we've handed down the law to him. Now, that's a lot. Some people can't accept that. Or they're like, well, what if my, you know, or my kids are different. And I'm like, all right, that, that is totally possible. I don't know. I've only raised these three kids. <laughs> right. But as soon as we came to that conclusion, we decided that in our family, the whole argument over screen time is bullshit. <laughs> like, this is the most useful device ever made by human beings. The, the argument over screen time, and I realize I've been talking a long time. I'm sorry, Paul. I promise you'll get your turn. <laughs> um, the, the whole screen time, the whole argument over screen time is sort of inherited from the old days when parents would be like, all right, you've had enough television, go outside. And it's just that same idea again. And I'm like, but this is different from television. This isn't just passive drool all over yourself and eat Cheetos entertainment. This is like YouTube filled with endless educational videos and Wikipedia. And, you know, the sum total of human knowledge is on the other side of that screen. Why would I limit your access to it? It would be like a parent like, all right. You've had, that's 20 minutes of book reading now. Go watch some television or something. <laughs> what parent would do that? Right. So, so we were very much against screen. So I'm like, yeah, the more the better. You know, have all the screen time you want. If you lift a rule like that, like our kids would be very greedy with their screen time. Once we lifted the rule, they binged on it, you know, just play games for like a week straight. And then they were like, all right, I've had enough video games. And then they sort of began behaving like Heather and I. Use your computer to be useful, and then use your computer for entertainment. And you move back and forth between the two, like I do constantly all day. And began behaving much more in an adult way. Because we weren't rationing their access to, to entertainment. They knew they could have it when they wanted it. So they didn't have to get greedy when they finally got access to it. And they didn't fight over it anymore. I'm sorry I talked so long. Paul, your turn. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'm a little, uh, again, same thing, hesitant, because this it gets really close to, like, religion and politics and stuff of, like, here's how everyone should, should behave. So uh, I'm just going to state my, like, general parenting principle in the most general way, which is that uh, 
my wife and I treat our children as if they are people who are not particularly competent. And then the things that they're competent at, they need to, you know, use that competency in a, in a, in a way that's responsible. And the things they aren't competent at, they just, you know, they need some help. And um, so as far as we limit our own screen time, uh, which is to say, like, you know, we can't be just like playing all the time and never going to bed or whatever. You know, you have to take care of yourself and you have to take care of your chores. You have to go to like I go to work and, you know, my my wife has to you know, take care of the baby and, you know, work on the garden and stuff like that. And you can't leave the house a mess. But if you've taken care of all your responsibilities and you've, you know, you've fulfilled your obligations. Yeah, you can play on the computer. You can play outside. You can read a book. You can draw. You can whatever you want. It's it's just another another activity. So we also don't have a like a a hard limit on screen time. Uh, occasionally <laughs> there will up, be. We ended yeah. up agreeing again. Damn it, Paul! I was expecting yeah, I, you. I was I was kind of I was kind of disappointed at your outcome because like oh well, that's what we do too. I mean what what am I going to say uh, now? I I, I really thought you were going to come down on the side of, all right, we've got a system that everybody gets a turn, it's this long, and you had this really regimented thing. But no, you're super laissez-faire like we are. Well, there you go. Well, so we do um, we do have a limited number of computers that is less than the right. number of people that want to play on them. And so we do yeah. have, like, you know, every half hour, just, like, look at the clock at the hour and at the half, uh, everybody switch, you know, and play musical chairs, basically, you know, get up and everyone who's not playing gets a turn and everyone who's playing has to get off. And then if there's still a spot, then you can get back on based on, you know, if you don't have any chores or, you know, you've been uh, behaving well or not yelling at everyone in the house, you know, that kind of thing, like, you know, bonus points for behavior and stuff. Yeah. And we, we had a little bit of that too. And I guess I should, I guess I should, we had to do that too, but we didn't artificially ration. I guess I should clarify. You have to ration because you don't want one kid to hog the computer when the others, you know, would like to use it and can't. But, um, and we would get into, we would get into tricky situations where, okay, this kid is using the computer educationally. And the other kid is waiting for their turn so they, they can play video games. Like, I don't even know what the right thing to do is there. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. Like, I, they're both doing, you're educating yourself. That's beautiful. You deserve a turn and I don't want you to feel cheated. And I don't want this to be become like this stealth economy where you try and get a turn by doing something vaguely educational. And, uh, oh, that was so rough. I, I just hated it. Like sometimes it's like, all right, well, come in here and and play a game with me, <laughs> just to diffuse that, you know. So yeah, just to agree with you the, there, yeah, that is you, you have to do something about that, especially when you so have a lot of get, kids and not a lot of computers. Yeah, uh, to get back to Nick's question, the the perspective that Seamus and I both have is that like computers are a very useful tool and that like any useful tool, you should know how to use it properly. And that, uh, you know, children, I don't know if Seamus feels this way, but I feel that children are not, uh, very competent at using computers well. And so there's a lot of limitations that we place on them. Uh, as far as what they're allowed to do on the computer they can't just go and like, you know, sign up for streaming services and stuff. Like, we're not going to let them do that. But Sure. Uh, sure. Although we, you, you know, once they start earning their own money, you know, yeah, you're, yeah, you're allowed yeah. to spend that however and, you and want. And they do have, they do have money. We keep a, a spreadsheet, a Google spreadsheet of, uh, of all their, you know, their, their money that they've earned pulling weeds and helping out with stuff, you know, extraordinary uh, extraordinary helping or, you know, birthday money or whatever, they'll cash it in and, and convert it into, you know, put it in the bank of mom and dad. And then, right. yeah, if they want to buy, they, they bought maybe 30, 40, 50 bucks worth of uh, Minecraft, like Windows 10 edition, uh, you know, cosmetics and, and worlds and, you know, settings and stuff. And it's like, eh, I think it's a waste of money, but hey, it's your money. If you want to spend it there, you know, go for it. 
Isaac actually maintains, this is something he learned as a result of this, is he maintains a ledger. I was like, that's a cool, I don't know that that skill will be useful, but you know, he looked up how do you maintain like like a traditional accounting le ledger. Sure, you've got the yeah. two columns in them. So he maintains the ledger. Um, and I pay him for the die cast and he keeps track of all of that. And I think according to him, he his account has three million dollars in it. I don't know, I haven't checked his <laughs> math, but <laughs> no, but they, they, yeah, he does. He has he has an account of money that he has a, and now he's finally, I always hated that PayPal won't let you create an account. No, they won't let you transfer a young person's account into an adult account. You create it when you're 16 and they give you a little 16 year old baby account. That can't ever graduate into an adult account. Oh, or really? that didn't, or this is, well, this was several years ago. Bay had like, you know, a few hundred dollars in our oldest, Rachel. Um, had a few hundred bucks in her PayPal account and we just like okay here you did something here's some money or here's some you know you she gives us her birthday money and then we put it in her PayPal account so she has access to it because what's she gonna do with cash <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, like looks at what is this green paper for I don't understand <laughs> do I type this serial number in on the internet anyway so but then when she turned 18 they PayPal still wanted to treat her like a child and she had to figure out how to create a new account and there were all these rules about where, where you could transfer to and it was a huge pain in the ass to like get the I think she had to leave you know like some loose change in there like a dollar or something she couldn't get the last of it out because oh it's so huh. protected and you can only spend it you can't transfer it or something stupid like that hopefully they have fixed that now but when Isaac turned 18 recently, he got his own PayPal. And yeah, he just manages his finance. Nice. But, you know, he's he's 18, so. Right? Uh, there, there's a few questions closing here at the big, big bottom uh, regarding child's use of internet, smartphones, and video games, and technology in general. So, internet, um, the kids can browse YouTube. We've got... Uh, a safe mode YouTube account for them um, and they can go on Wikipedia but none of them really read that well and so most of the time when they go on Wikipedia they're they're supervised or, or we're holding their hand uh, through it or something like that clarify your kids are much younger than mine <laughs> yeah I just want I just want to My clarify that you're is, not talking uh, 12 right I want to clarify Paul's kids aren't 18 oh they don't read very well <laughs> that would be that, that would <laughs> right. sort of shoot no, down everything we just She's said. 10. Man, yeah. uh, what am I thinking? Anyway, okay. so uh, yeah, our, our kids are younger. And um, so, yeah, we don't let them go on the internet unsupervised. Uh, none of them have smartphones. None of them have their own smartphones. So it's just like, it's not an issue. Um, they can play any of the video games. I have, what, uh, two separate Steam accounts that I've created for the kids one for each of the kids' computers, and then we, my wife and I share our library with them. And they can play any of our games. Uh, we don't have any, any appropriate games, so that's, that's nice. It's convenient. <laughs> and, uh, and so they can, you know, install any of the games they want. They can basically, you know, run amok on Steam and, uh, you know, play whatever games they want. And then periodically, my wife and I will just, like, go through and uninstall giant games they've installed and never play. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that pretty much covers it. They, they watch a lot of Minecraft videos on YouTube, and they play a lot of Minecraft at the end of the day. The one I get sensitive about is screen time. It always breaks my heart to see a mother snatch a, a smartphone out of a kid's hand. You know, he's obviously reading. Snatch it out. Okay, that's enough of that. Go play with your brother or something. <laughs> or go outside, and I'm like, you just stopped learning so that he can go and stand outside. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't well, go and, outside. And that's the thing. I've got like, the internet like, in here. <laughs> yeah. Like your kids, uh, our kids will, you know, we, we let them play as much video game as they can get a hold of in two fists, but they'll periodically just like all decide to go outside and play imaginary games. They're, they're basically running their own like role-playing thing. They're, LARP, they're LARPing all the time, and 
And like, we didn't tell them to do that. They just decided because that's right. what they wanted to do. And they're running around outside and they've all got fictional names and they're, they're fighting and doing adventures and who it's knows what. Yeah, Isaac does gardening. Again, all on his own. He just decided he really liked gardening. You know, he's like a plant. We don't have a garden out in back of the house. We, we don't have a garden where you have an apartment, but we've got a little porch outside. And he has plants out there that he's that he... I don't know what gardeners do, but whatever gardeners do, he does it to those plants. <laughs> so Waters them, to presumably. Now, do, is that something you do? I don't know. You've it's got to a, play some Stardew Valley, man, and learn about gardening. <laughs> right. So, yeah, that's our parent. I can't believe we wound up exactly on the same page on this. This is ridiculous. Someday, I'm going to find something we disagree about. Oh, man, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be deep in politics if we do. Play Duel of Fates in the background while we argue over it. <laughs> Write in, folks. Uh, question us about all the things we disagree about in the diecast. All right. Well, that was a pretty good show. I hope I didn't press anybody's anger buttons with my laissez-faire parenting approach. Um, I know it's personal. I know you love your kids. Do what seems best to you. That's what I learned on, you know, over the, my past 23 years of parenting. Thanks for the questions, everybody. If you have a question you want to send into the show, maybe even a question about, like, video games or, you know, stuff like that, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. And that's the show. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Paul. Parenting thing is, yeah, it's, an, it's a fractal of the complexity, because it's like, how do you properly interact with another human being that has the capacity to become just as complex as yourself, but has an environment that is offset by like thirty years? What? How do you answer that question? You can't. And the most annoying thing is, you can't understand what the little bastards say.